right. Good evening, everybody. How's everyone doing? Yeah. Anyone come here expecting to receive from God tonight? Yeah? Say, oh, yeah. Now, I'm, I'm used to preaching in Africa, so you guys are going to have to get wild and crazy, all right? Cool. Well, my name, uh, as Pastor Abe said, is Nate Tanner, and I believe this is my fifth time coming um, to hang out with these guys, for lack of better words, and we just love Abe and, and uh, Rosebud and, and Walt. So good to see Walt here from Sealy Lake. So uh, if I can find a place for all the stuff, all the gadgets, got knives, and I know you're from Montana and you got preachers got knives in their pockets so I got a really cool buck knife for Christmas but we'll talk about that later but so happy to be with you guys and I hope you came just expecting to receive from God Um, I'm here with my beautiful wife and I'm gonna invite her up here and we're gonna just take a couple minutes and share about what we do around the world thanks Abe Um, we've been married July will be 18 years and we've got uh, two beautiful children we'll show you a picture here and we still like each other Yep. Not only love, <laughs> but we also like. You know, y- sometimes you can love somebody, but you really don't like them. You just kind of <laughs> love them in the Lord. We like each other. We do. So that's our beautiful family right there. That's uh, Gabriel. He's 15. And Amelia is eight years old. And we live in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho at the moment. And we are relocating back to Kansas City. Actually, we were packing everything in a box as we came this way. So yeah, yesterday it's we were packing up our crazy house my and house we're right uh, now. moving out on Tuesday. So. But God is awesome. It's not about what is going on around you. It's about knowing where you're standing with God. Come on. So when things don't go the way you expect, it never changes who God is, what he's calling you to do. It may change a little bit outside, but who he is never change. So we've been into a lot of stuff going on, but it's so exciting to see God through everything, you know? Yeah. So It's fun to be a part of what God's doing in the world. You know what? We're all called to be involved, right? Mm-hmm. Amen. There's no, no people sitting on the bench in the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. Everyone gets to play. And so uh, a little bit about what we're doing in the world. We have a ministry called L3 International. And uh, the L3 stands for the least, lost, and last. And our passion is really just to take the gospel, both in word and deed, to places where no one else is going. Mm. And so we go to overlooked places, unreached places. We've been in 33 nations of the world preaching the gospel scene. Um, and we've seen well over a million people come to the Lord over the last 20 years of ministry. But it really just started with saying yes to him. And uh, I grew up in a small town, Sealy Lake, Montana. Actually, I spent high school there, and that's where I met Abe. Um, his older brother and I were, were good friends in high school. And, uh, you know, I was just your average high schooler that was uh, a skateboarder, kind of a skateboard punk, and then had a radical encounter with Jesus Christ and said, Lord, I want to go to the nations. And so mm-hmm. that's where I met this cute little Brazilian girl in, in 2000 in Brazil. Yeah. And the rest is history. But it's interesting. I'm very excited to be here, by the way. This is a beautiful building. I've been here, I think, twice. Is that what it is? But it was in the other building. Um, so thank you for having us. You guys are always so welcoming and smiling. So he said, don't talk too much. But <laughs> I'm Brazilian. I, I'm I can't do anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm married to a preacher. Uh, so it's interesting when God calls you. And it doesn't mean it to be something crazy, but it's about saying yes and then stepping up. Like if you're sitting waiting, you're going to be there a while because go- God goes with the ones that are going, right? And as you go, and how many times we don't see anything moving, but God calls us. And as we go, doors are opening, different things are connecting, connections shows up. So I came from a tiny little town in Brazil. My parents, they were pastors and missionaries. They left their family from a nice town and went to the middle of nowhere to work with the Indians or natives or I don't know what they call in Brazil anymore. But that was my life. And God called me to go to the nations. And I'm like, how? <laughs> how? How are you going to go there? And he said, I am just asking you, what are you going to say? But I'm just a child. 
And God was like, what are you going to answer? So God is not waiting like if you have all things together. It's not about age. It's not about where you're born or it's about you responding to God calling on your life. So I want you to be very encouraged through this weekend. So this town will get in fire. <laughs> so you're the fire starters. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> So we want to share a few pictures from one of the nations we're working in at the moment. Um, how many of you have heard of the nation of Myanmar? Myanmar, it uh, used to be called Burma. Um, it's in Southeast Asia, borders on India, Thailand, uh, China up to the north. And we've been working pretty actively in this nation for the last couple years. In uh, 1964, the government took over the nation or not the, the government, excuse me, the military took it over and they, they expelled all foreign missionaries. And so from 64 to about 2010, um, the church went, for the most part, underground. There was a lot of persecution. And in 2010, they had a shift in government. And since then, slowly missions and the gospel mm -hmm. has started to go in. And so we've been able to go in over this last couple of years and um, do big open air evangelistic events, distribute just truckloads of Bibles, train leaders. And we're just going to share a few pictures. This is from our most recent trip there. This was a group of church leaders, and we were actually praying over the map of Myanmar and strategizing of how to get churches and missionaries and pastors and into Bibles. every region and Bibles into every region of the country. So we brought in 280 missionaries from around the globe, and we divided and we had an army from it 30 was awesome. Nations. And we went divided in five different teams, and we went to different uh, states. And preaching the gospel, just a little bit understanding. When you have the vice president's wife on the prayer meeting, and she's Christian, and she says, okay, if you had three C's on your family, and we're all looking to each other with the same face that you are right now, like what? You never would get anywhere in any job, anywhere, any position. You wouldn't be able to be in the government do anything and then we're all looking and she's like first if you're a christian then there's this minority tribe groups called chen and if you had hepatitis c and what well, okay but basically she was saying how they were christian and from this minority group and that god put her husband in a government a christian from this minority tribe and when she comes and say the president allow us the Christians to go to the streets and say, go and commemorate Christmas for three years in a row. That is like open eye, right? It's pretty amazing. So to be there preaching the gospel, thousands of people coming, it's a big deal. And I am so humble, but then excited to be able to be part of what God is doing there. So go, go ahead and, and roll a few of those pictures. That's my wife preaching at a woman's gathering there. This was just a couple weeks ago. One of the things that gets us really excited is we've been able to bring in, on this last trip, we brought in over 100,000 Bibles into the nation and, and just sowed, just sowed um, all over the nation. In our city, my wife mentioned we did, 25 or we did five cities. In our city, we gave away 25,000 Bibles, and th they were given to everyone that came to the outreaches events. Um, all the, the believers in the city got a full Bible, and to give you guys an idea, in Myanmar, it's illegal to print the Old and New Testament. And so the full Bibles, we actually have to smuggle in across the Thai border. Um, but that's, that's just a small pile there. Go ahead with a few more. This is one of the pastors. We loaded them up with Bibles to take back to their congregation. And you can see his very happy face. Now, this is a cool story. Go ahead. That and was show awesome. This one, that was after pastor's conference. They're like, can you come to a house call? I was like, oh, yeah, of course. So uh, we are going. It's like, oh, it's my friend, but he's a Buddhist. And I was like, okay. Uh, but his wife is really sick. I, I like told her, ah, Buddhist, sorry. We can't pray <laughs> for them. Sorry. Let's, let's go back <laughs> to the hotel. So <laughs> we get there, and you need to go up the stairs, and you see, like, Buddha everywhere, and you see, like, different, like, saints and things and or whatever it was, in, in you know, and yeah, and things. flowers and whatever they were giving. 
And we're like, okay. And then there is this beautiful lady laying down on a mat on the floor. And the neighbor giving her massage because she is in horrible pain because she, I think, had a stroke or something. She had a stroke, yeah. And uh, she lost movement, the majority of her body. And whatever was left was a lot of pain. So I went there and we started sharing about Jesus. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Um, and I started sharing who Jesus was and how he is the healer. And when you're accepting Jesus, you're accepting the healer inside of your body. And then Nate came in, and as Nate is finishing the preaching part of it, the Holy Spirit presence, because God is real, right? So God just, uh, and he loves to show himself, especially people that needs him. So it was awesome. Holy Spirit presence just shows up in the room. Yeah, the cool thing, let me just jump in there, is we prayed for her. We shared a little bit about God's love, prayed for her, and she started to receive a healing. Then she started to feel God's presence and cry. Now, she wasn't a believer yet, but she was getting touched by God's Holy Spirit. And so we, we used that as an opportunity to share the gospel with her. And both her and the other lady who was giving her a massage uh, actually both wanted to give their lives to Jesus. And so we led them both to the Lord. And then we prayed some more, and she got healed the rest of the way. And she stopped <laughs> listening because she kept looking to her hand. Because it was moving. So God is awesome. Yeah. Huh? God is good. Let, let you guys in on a little secret. The same stuff we see there, God does here in America. There's no difference. It's the same Jesus Christ, same Holy Spirit. So same things I want to encourage you guys to receive from tonight. We'll show you a few more pictures here. Um, this was a Buddhist man, possibly a monk. I'm not, not totally sure. But he came forward at the one of our altar calls and gave his life to Jesus and got a, a New Testament there. So isn't that face priceless right there? <laughs> Go ahead and do a few more here. That's one of the crowds. And you got to understand, this is the city of Mandalay. It's um, 1.7 million people, less than 1% Christian. It's a, it's, they call it the heart of Buddhism for the nation of Myanmar. It's the strongest Buddhist um, stronghold temples everywhere. And every night we had five to 7,000 people coming out to hear the gospel. And we'd look across the crowd and we'd ask the local pastors and they said at least 95% of this crowd is Buddhists that have never heard the gospel. So every night we'd call, preach the gospel and think of standing up and trying to communicate the gospel to people that had never heard it before, never had, never had an opportunity. So we made it as simple as possible and they would just sit there and they would listen to everything I had to say and uh, no amens, no hallelujahs. This is just a Buddhist crowd and then I'd call them forward, and they'd sit there for about another minute trying to figure out what they wanted to do, and then they would start coming forward. And so over the course of, of, of four nights, we recorded over a 1,000 Buddhist decisions for Jesus Christ. It was awesome. It was fun. So basically what we did to draw the people, we called the Myanmar Got Talent artists. And <laughs> so we had them there singing, and I think they're all Christians, the one we had, right? Yep. S and uh, and then we had some motorbikes that we were like they're drawing number and rice yeah, cookers and something and TVs a motorcycle these little motorcycles given away to the Buddhists so I guess whatever you do to to get them out there right but <laughs> and the interesting thing is depending the state that you are it's harder to be Christian so that state it was really tough to be Christians. And as we were there, the pastor was thanking us because they were feeling discouraged because their church keep being shut down all the time because the neighbors don't want to hear them. So they're like, thank you for coming. Thank you for bringing the Bibles. Thank you for preaching Jesus and to our whole town. And the interesting thing that I thought was they didn't like the Buddhists. They didn't like Christians at all. But they did like the miracles. So they tolerate us. But then they were going to hear a Jesus who is alive. And yeah. it would be speaking to them and they couldn't, didn't know what to do with that. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was awesome. God is so good. Is so good. and one of the nights, um, they brought me to the side. And there was this older man that, like, two men carry him in and sit him in a chair. And they said, the pastors and one of your group came to his hut and pray for him, and he got better. 
So I looked, and he was missing some part of his toes. And I don't know what happened. And was very infected and was going through his leg. And he was in tremendous pain. So I pray for him. Do you feel anything? Anything happened? No, nothing. I pray again. The same thing, nothing. So I was like, let me tell you about my Jesus. He wanted me to pray. I'm going to talk to him about Jesus first. Do you like to receive Jesus? Do you understand Jesus is the healer? And when we receive, you're receiving the healer inside of you. And I talk about salvation really fast and, you know, how God created him. No. Okay, that's fine. And then I looked, and there is, like, probably his daughter or daughter-in-law with him. So and his wife. So I felt I was supposed to go pray for the wife. So I just left him there. The pastor was like, what this lady is doing? It's like, the wife's not the one that needs prayer. And I started speaking, and God started giving words to her. And she just melts down crying. She can feel the presence of God. And then her daughter-in-law has some problem in her back. I have no clue what it was. But she was in tremendous pain for a long time. So I pray for her. She gets totally healed. And then the pastor, hey, hey, he wants Jesus. And I was like, awesome. Then you pray for him, you know. So he prayed, received Jesus. And pretty soon the man is healed. And the man is walking away straight up because he's healed. So God is so good. You know, he loved us before we loved him. So I better go sit down. Amen. And let no, this preach it, preach it, girl. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Amen. Thanks, babe. I love traveling. Traveling with my wife. We, uh, we get to travel all over the world. Um, next week, I'm actually going back to Myanmar um, without my lovely wife this time, but uh, I'll be there for two weeks. Ask for prayer. I know this is one of our partner churches, so please partner in prayer with us next week. We'll be in several two regions of the, wor of the nation um, doing trainings for evangelists and, and church planters. So we're bringing together 100 evangelist handpicked in each region, one for the north, one for the south, and we're going to spend four days training, equipping them. We purchased 40 sound, small sound units, mobile sound units, to give to select evangelists. And so our heart is to uh, just empower the local believers and local evangelists, so keep us in prayer. Amen? All right, who's ready to receive from God tonight? Yeah. Amen? So we're, we're going... Uh, Tonight, tomorrow night, and Sunday, and, you know, our goal was that you would get touched by God, and you would bring, you know, bring people in that need to get, that need a touch from God. Um, Abe's calling these healing and activation meetings, and as I was thinking about this term, activation, um, the, the, if you look it up in the dictionary, what it means, it's, it's a, a chemistry term where there's a reaction between two chemicals, and this reaction causes a reaction that, uh, you know, that generates something that goes on, and that's really what this is about. You know, you're going to come, you're coming here, you've got needs, God's going to meet where you're, you where you're at, you're going to be healed, you're going to be set free, but you need to get activated in what you've got on the inside of you. Amen? You know, because it's, uh, I'm done with superstar Christianity. And we're not calling these healing and impartation meetings. And there's nothing, you know, he, impartation is a biblical concept as well. But the problem is, when I gave my life to the Lord, there was this big emphasis on impartation. And what you had is you had folks like you and me running around to the big man and woman of God, hoping that they would lay hands on them, impart something that you don't have, so that you can now be effective in ministry. Anyone ever been a part of something like that? We wouldn't call it that, but that's really the concept that I've got something that you don't have, and if you get me to pray or if you sow into my ministry, then you're going to get it. That is so removed from the new covenant, so removed from the gospel. You are complete in Jesus Christ. And so what we're doing is we're activating you in what you've got in the inside of you. And as we were worshiping, I was thinking about Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3, where it says, it says, the word they heard, and it's talking about the children of Israel, it says, it did not profit them because it was not mixed with faith. So the gospel mixed with faith causes this reaction where you receive whatever it is you need from God. And you also begin to bring that to other people. And, uh, you know, I want to read a few verses, and I want to I share tonight about the faith, hope, and love that comes from the gospel. How many think that sounds good. 
I thought about the sin, hell, and judgment of the gospel, but I, I figured it would be faith, hope, and love of the gospel. So Romans 1.16, we all know it. It says, for the, or, uh, um, for the gospel, oh, actually, let me, let me read it so I, I don't mess it up here. Romans 1.16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to the salvation of everyone who believes couple things I want to point out to you. It says that the gospel is the power of God. What's the power of God? The gospel. Where is the power of God? It's in the gospel. What is gospel? Good news. Thank you, Abe. So the gospel is the good news, and it is the power of God for the salvation. Now, here's where we tend to get things wrong. That word salvation or saved is the word soteria or sozo in the original language. And we tend to think that salvation just means you get forgiven of your sins. You know, God comes in to live in you and you get to go to heaven when you die. But salvation, if you look it up in the original language, it means to be saved from sin. It means to be set free, delivered, healed physically, made to prosper, blessed, given peace, made whole, sanctified. It's the whole thing. It is the whole thing for the whole person. God cares about every part of you, not just getting you saved so you go to heaven when you die. He wants you to go out in style. Amen? You know, he wants you blessed. So the gospel is the power of God. The gospel provides all these things. So we're emphasizing healing, but you might have come in here and you need, you need to be healed emotionally. You've been broken. You're, you know, you're, de- you're in despair, depression. The solution is the gospel. You know, may- maybe you've dabbled in witchcraft and the occult and you've, you know, you've got little critters in your life. <laughs> you, you, know, you need to be set free from demons. The power's in the gospel. It's you, the gospel will set you free. If you need to be heal, healed physically, it's the gospel. The gospel is the solution for every problem. God doesn't have all these different solutions to different problems. He has one answer, and you know what that is? It's Jesus Christ in the gospel. You know, John 10.10 says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You know, the, the thief is, is the enemy, but it's also religious people that steal the life of God from you. Interesting thing about that verse is the thief in John chapter 10, it's talking about religious people that kept people in bondage. The thief, religion, works by the enemy. I'm not saying that the devil doesn't do that as well, but religion will steal, kill, and destroy life. The devil steals, kills, and destroys life. God comes to give abundant life. Jesus came to give abundant life, excess life. That sounds pretty good to me. What about you guys? That's what God came to give us. So I want to share with you guys a story. And if you guys got your Bibles, I want you to look in Mark chapter, chapter 5, and we'll, we'll read in verse 25. You know, people need hope, they need faith, and they need the love of God, and that's all in the gospel. And, you know, I, wa- I want to encourage you, as, as Abe did, just tap in, put a draw on what God wants to do in your life tonight. So we've got this story in Mark chapter 5, verse 25, and it's very familiar, but I want to I point out a few things to you. It says there was a certain woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years, and she'd suffered many things from many physicians, and she'd spent all she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. That sounds like a pretty desperate situation. And what you've got to understand about this woman is she was an outcast, um, in Jewish society, she was considered unclean. She was ostracized. She couldn't live with her family. So she had no value. She had no self-worth. She, had, she was sick, and she had spent all she had on doctors for the, pa- the previous 12 years, and instead of getting better, she only got worse. But in verse 22, it says, or 27, I've got my faith Bible. It's got letters that are about this small. It says, when she heard about Jesus, say she heard about Jesus. She heard about Jesus and she came up behind him in the crowd and she touched his garment. Now, I, w- I want you guys to see that she heard about Jesus Christ. 
Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now that word, word of God, in, in the original language, it's word of Christ, Christos or word of Christ. It's not saying that if you need faith, you just find some random scripture in the Old Testament and then faith is going to come. How many of you guys have heard it taught like that? Faith comes by hearing the word. No, faith comes by hearing the good news of Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. And if you don't believe me, you can look in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. If you go three verses before that, what it talks about, it talks about the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Jump a few verses, and, and then it says, and now faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, word of Christ. Faith comes when you hear the good news of Jesus Christ. You know, if you need a miracle from God today, if you need God to move in your life, the answer is hear the gospel. Hear it and believe it. And the crazy thing about the gospel is that it, on, it not only requires faith, but it imparts faith. Think about that. It not only requires us to believe, but when we hear it, it actually produces faith in us. So God provides faith through the gospel. So this woman heard about Jesus and she came up behind him in the crowd, and she lays hands on him. She, she grabs him, and she touches the edge of his garment, for she said, if only I touch his clothes, I shall be made well. And immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. So she comes up behind Jesus Christ. She hears about him. She comes up behind him. She pushes through the multitude just to get just a handful of his clothing because she said to herself, if I only touch the edge of his clothes, I will be healed. That was where her faith was at. She believed she needed to touch Jesus and she would be healed. Let me ask you this. Do you believe she had to touch him? She could have just received Think of, think of the, um, the Roman centurion. He says, Lord, you don't even have to come into my house. Just say the word, and you're going to be healed. That's enough for me. Another man in, in John chapter 6, it says he took Jesus at his word, and he went, and the miracle took place. You know, I want you guys to know here that you can, be, you can receive a healing, you can receive a miracle right where you're seated tonight. Now, we're going to pray, we're going to lay hands, we're going to do all that stuff. We're here to stand with you, but you can reach out. And you know why? Because it's already been provided. It's already a done deal. It's not something that you've got to generate and work up by your faith. What is faith? It's linking your need to God's supply. That's my definition of faith from this story. It's linking your need to God's supply. If, gotta be, if you need to be forgiven, if you're not right with God, if you haven't been born again, the answer is link your sin to God's forgiveness and righteousness. If you need to be healed, you link your sickness to God's supply. That's faith. That's what this woman did. And you can do that right where you're at tonight. Now, years ago, we did a, a, a big crusade in uh, the nation of Zambia. And on the second night, I was preaching on the paralytic man from Mark chapter 2. And as I, as, as I started to preach, I watched this, this crippled man being carried in, and he was set in this little plastic chair off to the right of this, the stage. And the whole night, I was, I, was, you know, I, was, I was preaching with him in mind. I was thinking, man, God, I'm going to get done preaching. I'm going to go down. I'm going to lay hands on this guy. I'm going to command him to walk. He's going to be healed. It's going to be great. And so I, you know, I preached the gospel. I sowed the word. The power of God's in the gospel, right? Preached the word. And the whole time, I'm thinking about this guy. And when I got done, I hopped off the stage. I walked over to him. And I'll never forget, he looked at me, he pushed me aside, and he pushed himself off the chair and began to walk. <laughs> Didn't say anything. I, what I heard is, I don't need you to lay hands on me. I'm believing the word. I'm acting on the word. And he just, be, he just took off across, the, across the, the dirt there, walking, no problem. Didn't even lay hands on him. Didn't need it. He received the miracle right where he was at. Faith is you link your need to God's supply. You know, think about in the, in the garden, in the beginning. God created everything perfect, right? Now, he, he took a man and a woman, put them in this garden, 
called Paradise, and they, they literally had everything they needed. They weren't, they weren't sick. They didn't, uh, you know, they, they didn't get the, the February flu that comes around. They didn't, they didn't even know it existed. They had everything they needed. They, they weren't poor. They had, they had all the fruits and vegetables they wanted, and then it actually says that there was these rivers that had like gold and silver and precious stones flowing right through, so they were very well-to-do. But even better than that, they walked and talked with God. They had no shame. They had no guilt, no sense of lack. They weren't feeling like there's something lacking. And the only requirement was to believe in God, believe that God was good, that he was their father. They didn't even call it faith, but they just were called to trust God. And out of that relationship, they had everything they needed, right? See, the Bible, it's all about faith. Uh, but in the past, we've made faith a work about what we've got to do to get God in our lives. But true faith, it just comes alive when you hear the gospel. Faith is our response to what God has already did. And through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, he has done everything you need. You guys understand that? Everything you could ever need has already been provided. So let's go back to our story. So this woman reaches out her hands, she touches, she links her need to God's supply, and it says, immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself the power that had gone out from him, he turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? Have you ever found that fascinating? I don't know, I have. Do you think Jesus was, li do you think he knew who touched her? Maybe, maybe not. But, but here's the thing you gotta understand. She linked her need to God's supply. Jesus didn't even know, as far as we know, Jesus didn't even know that this woman was in the crowd, did he? He didn't ho know who she was. He didn't know her need. She came up to him oblivious of what, what he knew and she reached out and took hold of what God wanted to give her. She linked her need to God's supply. And that's what faith does. You know, we, we think that faith is like magic, but it's more like chemistry. You know, it's guaranteed. It will work. If you mix your need with faith to God's supply, something will happen. It's not magic. It's not using a set of words. It's, it's, it, it's, it's a guaranteed thing, guys, just like gravity is a guaranteed thing. God has, he, he has set faith up to work in a certain way. That's why Paul called it the law of faith. He called it the laws of faith. Here, here on, in, you know, on planet Earth, we've got the laws of gravity, thermodynamics, different things like that. There's the laws of faith, and when you connect to them, you can receive. Miracles will manifest. They will happen. What that means is God is not just dishing out healing for this person and that person based on how, uh, the, how, what level of faith or what level of prayer and fasting they've done. You guys, this will make faith easy. I want to make faith easy for you guys. God isn't just sitting up in heaven determining this person gets a miracle and this person goes home sick. He has already provided everything you need. And that faith that comes, that receiving comes through the gospel. And that's what this woman had. She reached out in faith and she received what had already been available, made available. God has made available everything you need. And it's in the gospel. So our story is a story of faith. It's a story of hope. What is hope? Hope is your vision. This woman had enough courage to take her eyes off of herself, off of her situation, off of her problem. She had enough hope that if she could get to Jesus, her life would be different. Hope, it, it means confident expectation of good. And faith and hope, they're married together. They work together. It's impossible to believe God for things if you don't believe, if you don't have hope. Bible says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. And there might be certain people here tonight that, you know, you've almost lost hope, but God's coming to you, and he's saying, I am restoring hope. I'm giving hope to you. I'm restoring your brokenness. The gospel brings hope. At one of our other festival events, our crusade events we did, there was this old man that, that came on the first night of the event, and he had, um, he had been a farmer his whole life, and so he was, he was crippled. And he had, um, 
he had arthritis in his, his bones in his joint, and he would kind of pull himself along with a stick. And one of our team members prayed for him, and then he came up on stage, and he gave us his walking stick, and he, he continued just to walk and dance across the stage, completely healed. Totally healed. But what, got my, what really got my heart was the last night, as we were f- finishing up things, he came up on stage, and he's walking, and he takes the microphone, and he says, thank you. He says, this week, I've been not only healed, but I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And he said, now I'm going back out to my farm because now I can plant and harvest and take care of my family. You see, the gospel, it restores people. It restores them emotionally, physically. It restores their value and dignity. And that's what God wants to do for every one of us. He just doesn't, no, not only wants us forgiven, he wants us healed. Not only wants us healed, but he wants us dignified. He wants us walking with the true value that he's put on us. So this woman, Jesus not only heals her, but he, he turns around and he says, who touched me? And the woman, it says, she comes and falls down at his feet and said, Lord, this is what happened. And I love what he says in the last verse, in verse 34. No, she comes and she's fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her. And she falls down before him and tells him the whole truth. And he says to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. That's the love of the gospel, friends. Jesus restores faith, hope, and love. The Bible says that even when we were sinners, even when we were dead in our sins, God loved us so much. It doesn't say that God was so ticked off at the world, ready to destroy the world, that he sent Jesus, does it? I think some preachers, that's what they preach. God is so ticked off at the world that instead of killing you, he killed Jesus. Now come and have a relationship with Papa. No, right? The gospel, I see it, the gospel is about a a superhero team called the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who was so passionately in love with people that God wrapped himself in flesh and blood, experienced our brokenness, experienced our pain, and he came to our level to restore us back to his level. I see it about a father. The Bible says God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. God was in Christ. It was God the Father rescuing us from sin, from death, from hell, from sickness, from shame, from condemnation, from despair, restoring us back to relationship. The gospel shows us our value. The gospel shows us the heart of God, the love of God. Now, I used to think, man, God, you know, I love you so much. See what I'm doing. See what I'm doing for you. Now, I'm a missionary. I've counted the cost, but that doesn't impress me. What impresses me is God's love for me. The Bible says this is love, not our love for God, but his love for us. You know, I used to think, God, I want great faith. But you know what impresses me now is how much God has faith in us. Think about that, how much he trusts us, that he's put his whole program called eternal life in our hands, the gospel in our hands. And he's called us not only to go and share the gospel, but to show the gospel. It's a, the gospel of the kingdom is a show-and-tell gospel. You share it, you tell it, you tell it, you show it. It's the kingdom of God. The gospel restores faith, hope, and love. The gospel is God's solution to every single problem you ever had and ever will have. The answer is not get more faith or get more of this or get more knowledge or get under more understanding, but fall in love with Jesus. The answer is find out who Jesus is alive in you, what he's given you, and what he's called you to do. You guys tracking with me tonight? It's good news. Sometimes people go with me on, on mission trips that we do, and, uh, and they say, Nate, I expected you to be preaching something more profound or more refined or more polished, and uh, all you do is tell people about Jesus. And I don't know if they mean that as a good thing or a bad thing, but I take it as a good thing. You know, I, I like to study theology, but what I found is most of those things really don't matter in light of eternal life. Now, w- when Jesus is going to come back, I believe he's going to come back, but when he's going to come back, it really don't matter that much. 
We got work to do, right? Our job is to get good at the gospel. Find out the gospel. The gospel is not only for, for sinners, it's for saints. If you've, if you've gone past, if you've outgrown your passion for the gospel, you've outgrown your passion for Jesus. Because the gospel, it is God's solution. I think of it like a diamond ring. If you hold a diamond ring up to a microscope or a magnifying glass, you'll notice that every facet of that ring is unique. It has different colors, different veins. And that's, that's like the gospel. You could spend a hundred lifetimes discovering how unique every facet is. That's why Paul called it the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of grace, the gospel of peace, the gospel of God, the gospel of Christ. He had all these names for the gospel, but it, it's all about Jesus. And Jesus is, he's here because you're here, right? We don't need to beg and plead for him to come but we need to posture ourselves to receive from God. We need to get ourselves in a place where all things are possible. The Bible says all things are possible for those who believe. And so what we want to do tonight is, is corporately come into a place where we can receive, we can tap into everything that's been freely given to us through Jesus Christ. It's not something, it's not begging and pleading for God to give us something it's tapping into, receiving what's already been provided for us. And like I said, whatever that is, you know, you might, you might just walked in off the street tonight. I, I don't know everyone that's here. And you might, uh, you might just have walked in here tonight and you don't have a clue what's going on. Like, who's this, who's this crazy redneck up in the front talking? But something's stirring in your heart. And tonight, you're not here by accident. No, you're here to encounter the love of God. And you might have you read something on Facebook and said, I'm going to give this a try. I need to be healed. I need a miracle. And maybe you've been to other services. You've heard other people making all these promises, and you've, you've never been able to receive your healing. Now, I'm not here to say that I'm, I'm Mr. Holy Roller Faith Man. Amen? <laughs> Just a disclaimer. But Jesus is here, and he has everything you need. And we've seen him do wild and crazy things we've seen every miracle in the new testament with the exception of the dead rays but that is on my list we've seen cripples walk we've seen blind eyes see we've seen the deaf hear mute speak we've seen lepers cleansed the gospel stuff but you know what if you had been out there god would have used you just the same he used me amen but we've seen it so I want to just ask everyone to stand to your feet right here. And I want to do, do a few things here tonight.